Hello, everyone. Um, my, na my name is Ayou Fakir, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, some of the principles of Scala that make uh, new developers um, fear the language and fear the uh, functional programming paradigm. Um, I work as a data engineer, and I started working uh, with Scala uh, more than four years ago. And then I entitled this talk, uh, Breaking the Entry Barriers and Making the Scary Keywords um, Accessible. Okay, now the beginning of the journey. Uh, four years ago, I, I wrote my first um, lines of code in Scala. Then someone told me about this simple but yet powerful uh, concept called um, the monad. I googled it. I didn't understand a thing about what this uh, monad means. And then I asked Nicola, my Scalafist of choice, and I asked him the simple question, can you tell me what a monad is? And his um, answer was very straightforward, at least from his point of view. And for him, a monad is just a monoid in the category of, of endofunctors with product replaced by composition of endofunctors. I cried, and um, uh, I thought I will never be able to write one single line of code in Scala in my entire life. And um, that was tough, okay? And uh, the goal of the talk today is to um, help you tackle some of these uh, scary keywords, and uh, hopefully after the uh, 20 minutes you will become Scala experts uh, of the world. Um, I'm not going to talk about what is functional programming. I think you guys had uh, enough talks uh, talking about that. Uh, but the why of function programming is something very interesting for me. So the first uh, why is that it's pure, and we are going to talk about the uh, concept of purity uh, later on in the presentation. But then, uh, when we, we write uh, functional programming code, um, we write um, readable code, okay? The programmer that I was a few years ago before um, started to, to um, write Scala code is really different and in the opposite of the programmer that I am today, thanks to functional programming. Uh, it's maintainable, okay? So it's, if it's readable, uh, this makes it maintainable, that's uh, true. It's breakable into pieces, and this means that uh, in the other side, it is composable from pieces, okay? Uh, and one of the most important uh, points of this is that our little brains are not able to reason about huge problems, okay? If I talk to you about the, um, the education problem, it makes no sense. What is the, edu the, edu the educational problem? Are we talking about teachers? Are we talking about students? What's the point, okay? So uh, functional programming um, allows us to reason about uh, simple concepts and to solve uh, small problems and by the end of the day, we are able to solve um, bigger problems. And of course, if you um, write functional programming code, uh, I'm sure your mother will be proud of you. Okay, let's go back to the basics. Uh, let's define the category, okay? Um, all the definitions that I'm going to give you today are not exhaustive, okay? Um, but then, uh, let's... Uh, assume that a category is a really a simple concept and it only consists of ob objects, okay, that can be anything, and links that we call arrows in literature that go from one object to another object, okay? Uh, then uh, what's important, uh, of course, is composition. The concept of, of composition, we are going to see it, uh, will um, help us understand lots of uh, scary keywords. So simply put, I have an object O, which has an arrow from O to B, and then B, uh, which has an arrow from B to C. That means that uh, O and C are linked by composition, and we can have an arrow from O to C. That's very, uh, really straightforward. Uh, now, what are these arrows? Concretely, these arrows is what we call morphisms, and these morphisms, let's re uh, reduce the definitions, and the definition, sorry, and um, let's all be, um, let's all say that amorphism is a function, okay? We, know all, we all know what a function is, okay? So if I take a function f and I apply the definition of composition that we just seen, um, I have uh, three functions, f1, f2, and f3. Uh, the first one going from O to B, then from B to C, and then from C to D. Um, I can compose 
my three function, uh, my three functions, sorry, um, the way I want. And why I'm talking about this is uh, that we can deduce that composition is first associative, and that's I'm showing uh, in the last uh, line. And then it has an identity, okay? What is the identity is what we call the zero or the, or the uh, neutral element, and it's just an arrow going from one object to itself, okay? Now that's cool. Uh, I think we all can understand what is uh, associativity, but what is the identity, okay? Um, I can't tell, um, but when I went back to the history, um, I have seen that the Romans, even though they produced lots of very great things, uh, that they have no, they had no zero number. Okay, and the thing is that um, when you are counting sheep, for example, it's either we had ten sheep or nobody was there. Okay, we don't, we didn't have a zero uh, as we uh, know it today to uh, calculate that. Uh, without zero, uh, we have no way to draw a line between negative um, numbers and positive numbers. Okay, the zero is the law, if uh, I might say. And then the zero can allow us to uh, describe the absence of a value or the empty values. I have zero money left, okay? Without zero, I, I cannot have this statement. Uh, I did not receive any items, and I think you got the idea. And we are going to try to generalize it um, afterwards. Um, then the concept of purity. Um, I talked to you about um, the idea of being able to reason about small problems and solve big problems. Um, I think that when we take uh, big problems, and again, I'm going to talk the, uh, uh, to take, sorry, the, uh, the example of uh, education problem. Uh, if we see that we have lots of problems in education, uh, the thing is that education is lots of pieces. So if we say, for example, uh, let's solve the problems that uh, kids are not going to school. And then let's solve the problems of teachers who are not motivated by going to school, etc. When we solve all these small problems in small, uh, with small solutions, by the end of the day, we are going to have this, the, the big solution um, that we was intended to do, um, rather than just thinking about the big solution that we have no chance to solve uh, by the end of the day. Um, and so, I'm pretty sure that you know the definition. A pure function is just a function that has one input and produces an output. Uh, it has no side effects. We are going to talk about them. And then a function um, does not have to do more than one thing. Now, this is not meant to define the pure function by itself, but it's a very good practice to just have a function uh, that does one uh, and only one thing, because that makes it more composable and we can link it to other functions very easily. What does it mean? Does it mean that, um, as a side effect, as I uh, mentioned here, writing to the console or writing to a file um, is a side effect, okay? Does it mean that um, we are just going to write programs that have um, no relationship with the uh, external world? That's, you know, when you work in big data, for example, and you work with Spark, you need to write some files in HDFS, okay? It is um, a side effect by itself. Um, so for this solution, um, there is a, a candidate that we are going to uh, talk about. It's the monad, okay? Um, now let me just talk to you uh, real quick about uh, the concept of immutability that you guys, uh, I'm sure, know. Um, is that when I assign a value to a variable, uh, it takes this value forever, okay? The, first thing, uh, the second thing is that we can have uh, concurrent programs uh, at will. If I have, um, you know, a variable that uh, never uh, changes its value, I don't care how many processors are working on this uh, value, nothing will change. And then when we work in the big data space, and we have lots of machines um, working with the same data set, for example, um, immutability is very, very, very important as a concept to work in distributed systems as well. Okay, now the scary keywords. What the hell is a functor? Um, I'm sure, guys, you have seen lots of talks about functors. Um, but we, we cannot define them enough, okay? So I'm going to redefine what a functor is. Um, but first, let's talk about the map. What a map is, is in the simplest way, it takes a list of objects, 
it, they can be number for numbers, for example, then a function or transformation to apply to it, and the map will take uh, care of the rest, okay? I have a list of characters, and I want to put them into uppercase, okay? What I need to do is just to write one function that, uh, that transforms one string into its uh, uppercase form, and then give it to the map with the list, and everything goes um, fine. Now the functor. Uh, a map can allow me, for example, to have a blue car and then transform it to a white car and to paint it, okay? That's true. Um, what's added when we talk about the functors is this little container here where uh, my blue car is not uh, a blue car in the space, it's a blue car inside the container. That's what we call the context. So what I need to do is that I need to put the car outside of the container and then paint it in blank, uh, in blank, yeah, and then put it back to the container. So a functor is only a map uh, plus the container that we call uh, a context. And the functor uh, obeys the laws of composition that we have seen earlier. Um, and uh, for the record, option, try, either, list, they are all um, functors. And by the way, uh, since the containers are from the same category, what we are describing here is what we call uh, another scary keyword, uh, indofunctors. So usually when, when we work with Scala, we, we work with um, indofunctors. Even Obama is happy to understand that. Um, I don't have much time, as my friend told me, so just skip this. Um, <laughs> Now, yeah, yesterday Martin uh, gave us a very cool talk about factors that I encourage you to uh, go through. Now, the factors have limits, okay? Uh, I realized that I had two cars to paint now, and they don't have only one car to paint. So what I did is that I called my old factor friend, and I told him, can you please give me your uh, map property so I can use it to paint my two cars? I gave him the two cars, he gave me this. Um, and Batman doesn't like it, okay? Um, the idea here is that since the functor uh, obey, uh, obeys, sorry, to the law, the only thing that, he, uh, that it can do is um, take a function, map through it, and apply it to uh, each uh, part of my list. So uh, to solve that, we have the monads. <clears throat> And they come with another property that we call the flatten, that we uh, implement through the flat map. So with the help of flat map, the cars would have been stored inside, uh, inside the same container because I have a container that can uh, welcome um, two cars. So as um, Abraham Lincoln said, uh, a monad is like a functor that knows how to flatten. Uh, in a more serious note, um, uh, a monad glues things together, and more pr precisely, it composes things, okay? Um, why do we need them? Uh, function programming is all about uh, functions. So we need an order of execution, and this order of, of execution comes with composition, okay? Um, then these functions might fail, and if we have an exception, an exception is not a function, so it doesn't enter the scope of function programming. Uh, so to solve that, we can allow our functions to return two, two things, either option or whatever. Um, and then a function might not be able to consume a maybe something, because if I have um, an option, it's maybe that I'm going to get a value, maybe I won't get the, uh, get the value. So thanks to the monads, we create a way to compose and um, link those functions. Uh, going forward, uh, the monoid has, uh, and yes, the same properties um, uh, as composition. That's why I told you before that is a very important concept. Um, so it's associative, and it has um, an identity, or the uh, neutral element. And what makes it monad is that it needs a type, whatever it is, uh, in string flow A, uh, and an associative binary operation over the type A. I need a binary operation that is associative, okay, that I can use uh, over the type that I, ha that I given uh, as a parameter to my monoid. Um, in practice, uh, and this is an example I got from uh, the cat doc, uh, I can have uh, um, a function called combine all, and what it does is um, it folds uh, elements together, okay, using the, um, uh, the binary operation. Uh, in the example of the list, it will be the plus, 
binary operation, okay? And the use of the identity here is that um, if we have nothing, the zero, we are going to uh, return an empty monoid, okay? And this is one of the examples of um, why uh, the identity of the zero are, uh, is important. What about side effect? Um, we know that printing, um, uh, writing to a file um, are side effects, okay? And so if we want to get aside and work with uh, pure uh, functions while um, uh, working with um, side effects, we can wrap them in an IO result, for example, and uh, loop through it with a fork comprehension and then yield results. And so we wrap our side effects, the prints, uh, with the monad and with the properties of the monad, uh, this allows us to use um, for comprehensions. Um, is this really pure? Um, I can tell. Um, for me, it's more of a way to explicitly say that my function is really impure and um, I am assuming it, okay? Um, but guys, I mean, uh, inch by inch, anything is a cinch. We cannot. Uh, become a scalar programmers or functional programming uh, developers and try to do everything at once. Uh, it's impossible. Uh, that is the only thing that comes at once. Everything else is progressive, okay? Um, and so the idea here is just to show you that if you want to begin your journey as a Scala developer or as a functional programming developer, um, you just have to do it step by step. Learn what a map is and then learn how to write really pure functions, uh, functions that do um, small things, okay, compose them, and then you can go forward and talk about applicative functors or um, whatever uh, other scary keywords are, are out there. What's next? Uh, you have a lot of concepts. Um, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a caricature. Um, you have closely categories, you have common as F algebra and lots of other things, but let's do it step by step. I'm done, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if you have guys some questions. Okay, we're good. No questions? It's okay, they understood everything. <laughs> Thank you. Can we find your slides somewhere? Thank you. Um, I didn't know um, the speaker deck until uh, Daniela showed, uh, showed it to me. And so I put um, a course that I give at the university about uh, functional programming, where I go really step by step about, um, and explain some concepts in detail. Uh, and you can find both uh, in this link. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, I think we had another question. Oh. Hi, thank you for presentation. Uh, could you tell me on, on your presentation you said that zero was invented by whom? Sorry, z z zero was invented by whom? Uh, I, I said it was invented. I said it was mostly used by Arabs. Yes. Okay. I Is that true? I think it was invented in India. Oh, that's another story. Let's talk about it. Yeah, later. sorry. <laughs> And we can't prove that, actually. Can you? Oh, in Google, Wikipedia? OK, good proof. Anyone else? Thanks. Thank you.